Buenas noches a todos, eh, bienvenidos a Gol sin Etiquetas, este especial de Navidad. Eh, les avisamos, este no es un programa en directo, es un programa pregrabado. Eh, y, y bueno, este va a ser, es, es el pequeño regalo de Navidad de, de Larry y, y mío hacia, hacia todo el público de Gol sin Etiquetas, que fielmente nos sigue todos los lunes. Y obviamente hoy, día de Navidad y siendo lunes, pues no podíamos, no podíamos fallaros. Además, estoy seguro que estáis ya todos hasta las narices de, de reuniones familiares y demás y deseando desconectar y poner la tele y tener una excusa pues para irnos a la habitación a una habitación aparte y, y bueno hablar un poco de lo que nos gusta y de lo que nos une que es el, este gran deporte que es el golf buenas noches Larry y feliz navidad <risa> buenas noches Gonzalo eh, no diremos cuándo lo estamos grabando pero pero sí nos lanzamos a, a por un especial de navidad interesante distinto eh, ahora veremos por qué y para mí con, con un invitado que, que, que no solo da mucho juego, sino que es de, de conversación muy interesante. O sea que vamos a ver lo que, lo que sacamos de hoy. Exacto, exacto. Eh, y como decimos, esperamos que después de haber hecho todas las compras de Navidad, por supuesto, en Castellana Golf... Eh, ¿Cómo son los regalos de gol de Navidad? Eh? Cuando, qué, qué bonito es cuando acierta y cómo es eso, esa tía cuando eras pequeño que te regalaba la típica mierda de golf que no servía absolutamente para nada, ¿sabes? Como el limpiabolas o el cuentagolpes. Esas cosas que como jugabas al golf te regalaban el típico, la típica cañaña de golf que acababan en el armario y nunca usabas. Pero no, en castellana golf solo hay cosas de máxima calidad y así que espero que, que todas las compras hayan sido puntualmente hechas en sus, en sus diferentes tiendas, sea la de castellana, la de golf park, o la, de, o la del RACE, aquí, aquí Pinedín, que nos brinda sus ofertas. Eh, Larry, hoy programa especial, programa especial de en tanto en cuanto, es el programa de Navidad y sobre todo que va a ser nuestra primera incursión en el, en el mundo anglosajón, va a ser nuestra primera entrevista en inglés. ¿Cómo, cómo, cómo va tu inglés, Ali? Eh, Larry, ¿está, está oxidadete? ¿Está bien? ¿Cómo, ¿Cómo te ves? Ahí es un tema ahí que ahora veremos muy bien cómo está el asunto porque me, me da que está peor que mi approach, pero bueno, eh, oye, hablaremos en indio <ríe> después de toda la, la gran educación que me ofrecieron mis padres y, y no sé, ya veremos lo que pasa. Y yo siempre, siempre que cuando me fui a estudiar a Estados Unidos me hacía toda la gracia hablar como, como lo, más, lo más cercano al español posible en cuanto a acento y ahí se me quedó. La verdad que mi inglés es bastante cutre en ese sentido, pero bueno, eh, hace, hace la función. Bueno, yo creo, yo creo que sobre Mira, pues lo que tenemos hoy con nosotros es un invitado es un invitado súper interesante. Yo creo que es un, bueno, aparte obviamente de un gran jugador. Eh, es eh, de esas personas eh, que da gusto cuando, cuando las entrevistan. Eh, por supuesto, es un, es un must, es un, es, like, es, un, es un follow en Twitter eh, fundamental. Eh, porque es, eh, como digo, siempre tiene cosas interesantes que decir. Es un tío inteligente, es un tío que, que además habla muy bien en público. Me recuerda en ese aspecto mucho a, a John Ram. Es un tío que, que delante del, del micrófono se viene arriba y además es un... Eh, es un, es un podcaster como nosotros, eh, así que yo creo que sin más eh, vamos a darle la bienvenida al dos veces ganador del DP World, Eddie Pepperell. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, guys. I didn't understand a great deal of the last few minutes, but uh, I assume you've said nice things. We did say we did say very nice things indeed, and and actually we were talking about your podcast. I mean, you're actually doing. I mean, uh, we've got we've got some competition here. You've got your own podcast going on, the Chipping Forecast, which I had the pleasure of listening a couple of times, and I think it's um, it's great fun. I mean, it's is it is it very different? I mean, the, the 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 playing golf professionally. I mean, you've always been good in front of microphones, but how is it having having your own show? It's fairly easy with the two guys that I do it with. You know, Ian Carter and Andrew Cotter are both very experienced, been in TV and radio for years and, and know the game far better than I do, actually. So, um, you know, obviously, as a player, I bring in a different type of insight and perspective, and I think that that had some value. But uh, each in our own way, I think we, we add value and, uh, and I enjoy recording every week. So uh, it's really no hassle at all. Absolutely. From here, I mean, we we truly recommend. I mean, for the for the for the English uh, uh, listeners here in 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 golf sin etiquetas, definitely it's a, it's a must. I mean, there's two musts here. You have, you should follow Eddie on Twitter, 
uh, it's it's always great fun uh, following him, and and uh, he's always has uh, witty, witty and smart things to say, and um, and with always with that with that English or British sense of humor, which, which I like so much, and and of course as uh, the, the 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 podcast uh, the chipping the chipping forecast. I mean, it's it's, it's definitely one that that would be on your on your on your list well eddie i mean a lot has been going on on the on the last few weeks as you know um i mean in spain here we're still a bit in shock of of the news of of of, of john ram going to live i mean we've the rumors have been there for for quite a while but i have to say that in the last few weeks they were a little stronger Oh, they had a bit more uh, more consistency to 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 it than, than in the past. I mean, what's what's your take on 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 John uh, doing the what what I can tell it's it's been a huge move to live. Yeah, it is. It's you know it's quite possibly and probably the biggest um, acquisition that Live have made so far. You know, in their two year existence, I think uh, it's fair to say, and it's a real. Um, you know, it's a shot to the PGA Tour for sure. This is a big loss for the PGA Tour and probably the DP World Tour. I will be interested to see how they react to this. Um, one would imagine that they might have to go a little easy on the rules with John, especially as it relates to playing in his home event in Spain. So I, I suspect some rules may change, and that's just a suspicion. I have no insight there, genuinely. But um, you're speculating, I suspect things will change a little bit with the DP World Tour in terms of their actions towards John and maybe other Live players as a consequence of this. So the ramifications are probably quite far reaching. Uh, listen, you know, you, as you guys probably well know, I'm, I'm not a, I'm not Liv's biggest fan. So um, it's, of course, I, I'm disappointed in it because I, I think that John, um, I would rather watch John play on the PGA Tour full time and the DP World Tour when he does play. So, um, you know, I, I've, I've never, I've not, really been one to tune in and watch live golf and i don't think that john signing with live will actually change that for me this has been one of the interesting things for me uh actually that i've realized in the last two years you know i'm i'm a huge fan of sergio garcia henrik stenson some of my very favorite players playing on live and yet i haven't watched and it's kind of identified to me that actually i'm i was less maybe a follower of the golfer as much as i was the the tour the event um, and the background and the history that, that underpins where we all play. And, and, uh, and again, I just think that John's, John's signing to live won't really make any difference to me personally. I, I won't be watching live as a consequence of John signing, but, um, but ultimately it's sad that I, I, I love watching John play golf as we all do. And, um, I'm sure many will follow him across the live, but uh, I suspect many won't either. Yeah. Eddie, let, let's, let's go one step, one step at a time. What would you do? If uh, if uh, you were the commissioner of the European Tour, what would you do with this uh, issue? How you, would you change rules now? Uh, so no nothing for Sergio, nothing for Henrik, nothing for anybody. Now that John moves, do, would you do anything different about Ryder Cup uh, pl uh, playing opportunities in Europe? What would you do if you were the CEO? Well, we can. I mean, let's 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 step back a little. I mean, I was, I mean, I, I think I think the news was were shocking for everyone, um, but I was very surprised with with Rory's approach. I mean, Rory, who's been um, quite, um, let's say, a strict when it came to the Leaf players uh, going uh, playing Ryder Cup, and and and, uh, and 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 as soon as 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 Ram made the move, all of a sudden Rory kind of changing the approach and saying, "Hey, um, we should be." Probably be making changes because we do need John at Bethpage in 20, 2025. I mean, do you think those those changes are actually going to happen, or, or I mean, wh where do you see this going? I I don't know that the Ryder Cup qualification process needs to actually change a great deal. You know, obviously Luke had six picks this time around, and I don't see that changing. I just think that one of those picks will be used for John, but equally he could quite well qualify. Uh, via the majors it's going to be interesting obviously to see if he incurs fines and sanctions the way that all of the other players obviously have done up until this point and of course you know the, the names that were mentioned there just by Alex you know I, I don't know this situation exactly with all of them in terms of the fines that they owed and whether they have paid them or not but uh, obviously I know the resignation of a number of players was due to the fact that they haven't paid the fines and they're not gonna they're not prepared to go on continually paying fines which is understandable so I do suspect that there might well be a different approach from 
the DP World Tour moving forward. And I and I also suspect that this kind of framework ag- agreement, quote unquote, kind of opens up there being a possibility to that happening simply because there is that distinct point in time where you could make the argument that it is it is reasonable to start putting in place slightly different rules based on this agreement that we're supposedly trying to work towards. So uh, I think there's a way out into some degree for, for Keith Pelley and the executive at the tour to kind of come up with something. Um, but I, I'm not privy to those decisions and and uh, I don't know what's going to happen. But I, I think John's inclusion of the Ryder Cup really isn't going to be affected in any way, shape or form. And I think he could simply just be uh, used as a pick in this case. I still wouldn't expect uh, any Ryder Cup points or of the like or world ranking points to start being issued to live golf as a consequence of John's move. No. No, definitely, definitely not. I don't see either the world ranking um, point thing is, is definitely going to be an issue going forward unless they change the format. I think it's either it's either moving to 72 holes and, and probably establishing a cut. And um, because, I mean, they are they are doing steps on the on the right direction. Actually, I mean, I mean Larry and, and myself, we were uh, two, three weeks ago, we were we were in Abu Dhabi playing uh, all those promotion events to get into leave. So now, I mean, there is a relegation system and a way to get in. So I, I think they're doing the doing small steps on, on that direction and, and that will happen um, maybe, but not, I don't see that in the, in that happening probably not, not this year, unless they change that format into 72 holes and, and probably establishing a cut. But what I do see, I mean, people are making like a, like a big deal of John moving, but I mean, my personal opinion is of course that other than the money, which of course is always very appealing. I know I have the feeling that John have more information on the table of, of how the how the negotiations are, are going and i have the feeling myself that this might um the john moving it's gonna probably make that um get together or or or, or that um, agreement is gonna probably happen sooner than later that's my feel i think i think because john to be honest he's been always very I mean, at the beginning, he was he was very not. I, I would not. I'm not gonna say against left, but I mean, he was he was defending the, his position on the PGA Tour. But I think, on a way, in the last few months, I think he feel betrayed. Probably the, the same feeling we all players had, uh, especially the ones that I mean stayed loyal to to the different tours. Um, but you can see there was a change on the tone, and, and probably the more the most conciliating um, player of all is probably been John. So I, I have I, my 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 gut tells me that that he's gonna try and 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 get the tools together because I think that's that's probably the best not only for the game but at the end for the for the golf fans who are the ones who are who are losing and i think the ones that lost the most on, on all this battle between between the saudis and and the pa tour is probably the the golf fans i mean as we are i mean we made this program because we are golf fans and we wanted to be in touch with the golf fans and and, and talking about golf which is what we like and as for now, I think the only tournaments that got benefited with all this are the majors. Other than that, I mean, everybody's losing. Yeah, yeah. Well, I agree with that, and um, I, I'm not convinced that this makes a deal more likely in the near term um, for a number of different reasons. I, it might well make it more likely in the medium term, but I would imagine that that would come with consequences for John and or live you know in part of the agreement i mean obviously i'm assuming that john here's john's deal is you know the other side of it to the money is that he has to play 14 live events or certainly close to 14 times and obviously once you add in the four majors you know we all know john doesn't play more than 20 22 times a year and this has always been the issue the whole the whole journey through right this this thing you know we were we were all three of us very keenly aware that it was difficult in professional golf to exist with just two major tours and and fulfill the commercial needs and the players needs in that environment you chuck a third tour in there which obviously is what live is and you know to me it was clearly never going to just work um there was always going to be this kind of division this power battle that that isn't unusual we should have always suspected that and i i can't see a resolution to that yet I, I really can't. And I don't think John's signing makes that resolution any clearer to me. In fact, I would argue the opposite reason being because he's gone for 500 million or $400 million. I mean, he's actually, he's upped the number, you know, and I made this point on Twitter. If, if he had have gone for 50 million 
this would have been a very different story. You know, if Liv was this successful entity, I think you don't need to start, you don't need to pay people 500, 400 million dollars to go. They'll go for a lot less. And he's he's still lifted the bar. You know, the price of the price of acquiring a player is going up and up at Liv. It's not going down and down. And I think while while that is happening, any other top player is going to be demanding huge sums of money to go across. And also the other side to that is any sort of compensation or equalizing fund that has to be put in place on the PGA Tour, Rory McIlroy and all of these guys, Jordan Spieth, they're going to want to be remunerated or remunerated to a similar degree. They're not stupid. They know they're not going to get $400 million because the PGA Tour can't afford to. But the fact that John has been paid such a large amount, I think, on the other side, is going to change the demands on the of the Patrick Cantleys and the Xander Schofleys and the Roy McIlroy's of the world. And so, you know, I, I'm I'm less I'm actually less sure that there's going to be an agreement in the near term between all three parties. Of course, I hope something can come together in the future that looks something like what I suspect we all wanted it to look like initially, which was maybe where Liv was a much reduced schedule and, and maybe replaced the World Golf Championships and maybe you had six tournaments at a certain time in the year and the team element could work. But it had to always be in addition. I, I always I do agree with Rory McIlroy when he says that. I do believe that myself you know it's about it being an addition and unfortunately live obviously we could discuss the hows and the whys that it came to be that way but obviously it, it chose a different path and and so we have this division so um it'll be interesting i don't know i'm just speculating again but um yeah that's how i feel about it yeah i mean it's it's, it's very hard to tell i mean um yeah i'm um, it's 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 we 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 wish we had like um like a crystal ball where we could see the future i mean in an ideal world it would be great to have um as you said i mean people players moving freely from from two to tour from tour to tour and maybe yeah maybe leave being kind of uh, that wall part of it where 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 um, i mean you get the americans to travel the world and and play all the places i mean uh, the likes of australia which apparently i mean i think i think for me i mean what, what i've watched of lift is um the ones the tournaments that happen abroad they seems to be the most successful uh, i think the this the first event we had in valderrama in um, in here in spain i think it was it was it was big when it comes to crowds uh, same the one in australia um i don't know the one uh, in london i've never been to the one in london but i have the feel i mean that's kind of the beauty of the lift uh, it's um but i mean larry you can tell us more about it i mean you were in the one in in, in valderrama uh, Eddie and I, we happened to be at the British Masters at, at a very interesting player meetings we we had there, which we'll talk about. <laughs> but I mean, how was how was Liv at Valderrama? I mean, how what was your take on Liv? Well, I I, <clears throat> I had mixed feelings. Um, I thought I thought the uh, uh, the format uh, a little bit um, I don't know how to say. Uh, out, it's too far away from the from the traditional golf. I'm I'm quite an old-fashioned golf player. I I love golf and I love uh, how how it has been uh, through the years and uh, all this music, um, all this party stuff uh, makes me feel like the the competition level is is a little bit down. It's it's more of a circus than a, than a than a competition. But uh, you get to see great players through four hours and a half. It's uh, it's flow. Um, it's it's short. It's it's nice. Uh, but it's it's hard to to follow the competition. Like um, it's weird. It's it's a different thing. Mixed feelings. I liked it in some ways, and I really disliked it in in some others. I think the the format is not is not yet uh, appropriate for for. For me, at least, what makes you not uh, feeling not uh, not not watching at all Leaf Golf, uh, Eddie? Uh, is is it the format? Is is just the way they have been established and the, the the way they do things, or what's going on for you not to watch uh, Leaf Golf whatsoever? Yeah, no. So I have tried. Uh, it's not like I've just out of principle not tried. <laughs> I did try and I just simply didn't enjoy the product that was on offer. Now, I should say I don't watch a lot of golf. I mean, for example, this evening, only this evening, I tried watching the, uh, you know, the father and son championship and the coverage was 
dreadful and I couldn't last more than 10 minutes. So I'm, I'm not here saying, you know, that the PGA tour is all this perfect thing. And, and so is the DP world tour, but live is, you know, this, I, you know, I, I, I don't consume a lot of golf on television anymore, generally speaking. And, and live never changed that for me. I think the problem live has is because of the money that it's putting in, it automatically puts itself on this pedestal. In my opinion, uh, if you're, if you're putting that much investment and money into something, what you would expect on the other side of that is a minimum product, a minimum level of something. And to me, it's failed on, on all of those fronts. And I should say, you know, like yourself, I'm a, I'm a pretty staunch traditionalist. It turns out when it comes to golf, you know, I, I, I admire so many aspects of professional golf and I always have done. And I've always been like us all on the wrong side at times and on the right side at times, whether that be making a cut by one or missing a cut by one, the pain that that feels, you know, there's so much jeopardy that's inherent within professional golf that I actually think drives an enormous amount of respect for professional golfers from everybody else because professional golf is so unique. The lack of certainty, the unprotection that we have is is very unique to golf, but it definitely builds character over time and, and great sports people. And we all know how difficult it is to play at the highest level. So you know, to see Liv just do away with that was something that I, I have always had a hard time with. And then to see the PGA Tour kind of follow suit um, was was even worse. You know, it's um, I don't like the general direction that Liv Golf has pulled the game professionally in. That would be my overriding, overarching kind of comment on it. And and I just hope that, you know, my fear all along has been that the Liv Golf becomes the pinnacle of professional golf. And, and it's where we see the top 50, 60 guys play outside of the majors. And and they can kind of afford to do that. I mean, they're slowly doing it. I'm at this point left wondering why they don't just go the whole way. If they have an unlimited pot of cash, I, there's a part of me that just wonders now, why don't they just chuck 20, $25 billion at this thing? because they could literally buy the professional game for three years and then they could start to strategically try and offload assets or make monetize them in certain ways, build equity, et cetera. And, you know, I don't know that it's got to that point, but I'm left wondering why, why they don't just do that as a strategy at this point. Um, but that's just an, that's an aside really. Eddie, I have to, I mean, I, I, I totally, I mean, I agree with you in, in, in some things. I mean, at the time I thought, I thought leave was, um, was quite a good thing for golf because I, I I've always thought that competition was good. I'm a, I'm a strong believer in competition, and and for some time I decided I, I thought okay this is going to kind of shake the tree of the of the PGA Tour. I mean they're going to get things going, which they did. I mean all of a sudden they well uh, they started raising the price money, and more importantly for me it was they they open different ways to access to the to the PGA Tour, which let's be honest, it's 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 the biggest tour in the world. Um, so I mean, all of a sudden you could you could enter. They they open like a qualifying school. You could get in through the DP World Tour. Then you had the university program. I mean, so all of a sudden, I mean, it was a great opportunity for young or upcoming players who wanted to get to the highest level. I thought it was good. But then now I'm seeing, I mean, all the money that is being thrown at the players and thrown at golf. And I have to be, I have to admit it's, it's, I'm a little skeptical, I would say. I mean, I don't think we as golfers, I mean, maybe definitely my, not myself, but I mean, I don't think we deserve that, that kind of money. I think the, 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 the money we're playing for now at golf, it's absurd. I don't know if, if, if that's your take as well, if, how you feel about it. But I mean, I thought we played, let's, let's, let's go back two years ago or three years ago. I think we played for more than enough. I mean, players making over a million, I mean, on the PGA Tour per week, I mean, for, for a victory. And now, I mean, I have to say that, that all this money that's been thrown into the game is just, I think we're we're getting a little spoiled, aren't we? Yeah, I, I agree. I, I was thinking about this earlier, actually. One of maybe the most um, egregious examples of this was what just happened with the PIP fund. You know, bear in mind that the PGA Tour, I think, just paid John Rahm correct me if I'm wrong, $9 million just before he signed to yeah. live. Yeah, they in had an effort hundred, to keep 100 him. million they had for the, for the for that program. For the and game. they gave nine to John. Well, $9 million, as far as I am aware, is about what Tiger earned in the mid-2000s when he won like eight tournaments. 
And, you know, that's not that long ago. And so you think 15, 16 years on, the, the same entity, the PJ Tour is paying the same amount of money to one player just to keep him that Tiger earned with all his great achievements. It's it's in just the most absurd place, professional golf. Many sports are in a crazy place. Football has obviously been there for a long time with the Premier League. It's not the only you could frankly call it an asset market. Now you could call it a market because John Rahm is an asset. And and this is something that's also different in, in the same way we consider houses and cars and all of these other material commodities and objects, assets. That's what we've turned golfers into. And I, and I don't inherently don't like that. Um, and, and I think sport is to me anyway, uh, I've always loved the romantic kind of elements of sport, the competition, those moments that it doesn't really matter how much money Tiger Woods was earning when he chipped in on the 16th of August all those years ago. It didn't matter to me how much money he was earning. When I watched him chip in and the ball roll in at the last moment, that was just the most incredible moment in golfing history. He could have earned £10 or £10 million for that chip. It's entirely irrelevant. He's there for the competition and the history. And slowly, well, maybe not that slowly at the moment, but that is being er eroded and degraded in professional golf. Yeah. And yeah. That's actually that's actually a very re recurrent question when you play with amateurs in in pro arms and things. I mean, they, they would ask you. I mean, do you ever think about the money? Um, I mean, and and the answer I would say it's it's always the same for every. I mean, I would say for ninety nine percent of the players would be the same, and it's, and it's no. I mean, you you're never thinking about the money when you're playing. I mean, you're thinking about making that part. I mean, you know it's going to be a costly part. I mean, it's, you know you know that shot might be dear or not, but but. But you're never thinking about the money as such. I mean, and I saw mm -hmm. an interview of, of Ram. I mean, I think right before the Tour Championship. I mean, those which is now when they when when they get to to spread all that FedEx money on that very last tournament. And and he was saying the same thing. I think we as professional golfers, yes, we do play for money. That's what we do. That's what we especially especially the ones that are not playing for history. Because I agree, there's a bunch of guys that they're playing to actually make a make a make a spot for themselves in kind of the history books. But the rest, which is 98% or more of the professional players, we're just playing to make a living. And money is definitely an issue. But we're not thinking about the money when we're playing, are we? Yeah, well, I, I would I would say there have been moments in my career where I have thought about the money. You know, I've had putts on the 18th green or the 72nd hole where I'm not, I know I can't win the tournament, but I'm in a high-ish position, and I know there's a lot on it. And yeah, there's a lot on stake, but you're not thinking how much this is going to cost me if I don't make it. No, I don't know, you know how it's much, there. but, it's, it's, but, but it's, it's behind your it's 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 there somewhere behind your back. Yeah, but it, it can act as a motivating factor, and I wouldn't ever say that money isn't important or that people shouldn't strive to earn more money at all i mean that's not my point but my point is is that we've we've the game of golf has been we've derived it to a place where it's it's only about money mm. and that's the issue and and that's the thing that's slightly new i think in golf and and it's something that i find just quite toxic and and corrosive over time you know money doesn't hold those in, intrinsic we're not connected to the same way we are competition and and the historic values of of competition and that is what the tours the, the metu traditional major tours are built on so um yeah alex you look like you have you have something to say no well, well it, what it's it's a little bit uh, scary to me is uh, is that leaf golf has put uh, the uh, professional golf in a place that is not sustainable and uh, maybe is for them for a while because uh, they have unlimited uh, amounts of money but uh, but you need to to keep your market sustainable, and and PGA Tour right now is not sustainable, and 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 obviously Live Golf isn't either. So um, <clears throat> the thing is that uh, they are they are exploding the market, and, and they cannot, they won't be able to hold this forever, because you cannot spend m millions times uh, what you earn, and. Uh, and what is going to happen is that uh, if they explode the market and they keep uh, growing the, the 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 money spending in this way, um, it might uh, it might we might get to a point that it's uh, there's no coming back point. And uh, in 10, 15, 20 years, this this might be a, a big issue for professional golf um, because uh, PGA Tour will not be able to hold this uh, growth for sure uh, is not sustainable uh, 
you don't you don't sell the product for for what you are spending so uh, it's 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 quite scary for me in the long yeah. term obviously yeah. no i agree and and what and also what worries me is that the only money we eventually have to fall back on is is the saudi money i think that's what's going to be interesting about the if there is any agreement um the governance structure and the legals behind that in terms of ownership rights that's going to be very interesting to see because you know i i think what's new about this um what's new about the saudi and the pif money into professional golf which hasn't really existed in any other sport as far as i'm aware up until this point is that they've only ever bought you know this team or that team and, and they've never had a, a full a kind of ownership of a sport uh legally put it that way and i think with what's being potentially proposed or what may or may not be proposed with the new with the new agreement and the new new co company as it was so called you know the, the legal kind of structure to that is something that i think will be interesting uh, i would be cautious about giving them too much um you know legal power frankly because at this point they have the money but that's not to say in 10 years they're going to have the money you know i i said this recently on another podcast <laughs> seemingly doing podcasts all the time at the moment, but it's you know 30 years ago it, it might have been the russians that had the money and then it was the chinese and it's the japanese and you know money moves around the globe all the time and and we are just we're right now they are taking advantage of the cash pile they have but that cash pile won't be forever and so what what does sustain however through time and the pj tour an example of this are institutions and organizations that are fundamentally built on foundational principles like competition and they hold values with them and they have long standing sponsors that grow with them the companies like rolexes the bmws the fedexes these types of companies you know they're built over they are they are decade long partnerships and so I would, I would just, I'm curious to see how the next few years unfold, you know, unfold, and I, and I hold your concerns as well, Alex. Alex, I carry the same concerns. Yeah, and then it's, um, I think it's, is the time, is the time to talk about leadership because, I mean, um, that's, um, those are the guys in charge of bringing those, those sponsorship and keeping those uh, companies happy. I mean, we've seen, uh, we've seen in the last few weeks, I think Wells Fargo. Has pulled out of, of of the sponsorship of of the PGA Tour. Um, I think 2024 is going to be their their very last season. Um, and apparently they're asking for a lot of money now with all these designated or, or elevated events. I forgot about the name, but um, I mean it's 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 a lot to ask for a sponsor. I mean to to ask them for 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 such big amounts of money, um, where they have to cover all the price money and and so on i mean just for a week of of golf and and tv spoke the tv exposure i mean and i think when we talk about leadership we can we can probably i mean i think one of the one of the factors that might have um, pushed uh, john ram away i think maybe was that i'm not going to say lack of, of, of leadership but definitely the a kind of a feel of of betrayal uh, which which a lot of players uh, have had I mean, it's it's hard for me to speak on on behalf of the PGA two players because I haven't been there for quite a while, but um, I know on the European tour. I mean, uh, I wouldn't like to be on on Keith Pelly's shoes. Don't get me wrong, or in Jay Monahan's. I think it's been really difficult times these last two three years in golf. It's been they've been absolutely crazy, and I would I would have never have like to be on, on on their shoes and they're in a very difficult position but um but yeah i mean i have the feeling that 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 some players are definitely feel that betrayal and and so especially what i'm feeling lately is that a kind of a lack of communication i don't know if you have this, that same feel but i mean it's it's i mean as if we are a members of organi organization and, 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 and both are and as they say i mean there's been a lack of of communication and information and i would like to to, to have your thoughts on that yeah well on that latter point i agree 100 in fact it has been that has been a topic that i've brought up a number of times in the last 12 months when i was on the committee you know i brought it up regularly that i felt the communication between management and how it filtered down was just not good enough and there are too many players left in the dark as to exactly what's going on you know these are these are um pivotal moments in our history there's a lot going on and i do think the players have a genuine interest um, as well as a right, obviously, to know what's going on. Now, I do understand that Keith's there to do a, a job, as is Jay, and, and there's stuff that needs to be remained private and to some degree. 
and you can't relay all the information and he's a very busy guy but i do think that there, there needed to be better communication throughout this period i would i would agree entirely with that and in terms of the wider leadership but listen i i also agree that i wouldn't want to be in their shoes either um you know in when you're in a position of leadership like jay monaghan was it, it he could have acted preemptively years and years ago um but any success that he would have had had in in acting preemptively is a sort of asymmetric risk reward to that you know when you act preemptively and something doesn't happen because of your actions nobody really remembers and so you don't really get any of the rewards whereas if you don't act then obviously or if you do act but it's not enough which is probably what we've seen um then obviously all of the risk is at your shoulders and and i think what we have seen jay unfortunately do is when he has acted preemptively it hasn't been enough and it's unfortunately been made him to look a bit like a fool and i think the pip money is is that is an example of that and arguably he didn't act preemptively enough when he should have done and um and that's probably going back two or three years time when the conversation should have been had so for me there are two kind of key moments in in jay mona in the last few years for the pga tour and, and that is that one well, first and foremost there wasn't a conversation had initially obviously with Liv and with the saudis to fully understand what they're trying to do to understand this 2030 vision because for the saudis this is more than just golf this is a geopolitical vision this is a this is a very grand vision that they have and golf is just a small part of it and i felt i think that if jay didn't know that then that's that's he should have done you know he should have that's part of his job he gets paid enough money to, to have that um, knowledge and vision and know that that's what I need to understand. So that was the first mistake. And then I think the second one happened obviously this year with the announcement of this framework agreement, because I think to a lot of players, and this is where the word betrayal maybe comes in. And this is where I'm at a bit with John Rahm. I wonder if that was the turning point for John, because I do happen to believe John, everything he said up until very late, you know, lately. Uh, and I believe him when he said he had no interest in joining live and I, and something clearly changed. And I, and I think, Maybe it was that that happened in June from the PJ Tour side of things that just opened the door a little bit to some players who had been otherwise very loyal to maybe say, well, hang on a minute, you know, I don't need to be loyal to the PJ Tour at this point. And so uh, the us against them narrative as, as, you know, it's not a very nice world to have to live in, but it, I do think on balance that it, it was actually working for the PJ Tour. I really do. I know they had lost some players, they'd bled some players, but very few of them were surprising. You know, they were all outsiders, whether they're Patrick Reed or Bryson DeChambeau. They were old and, and past their best, as we know, with some of the European players and the English players. Or they had a vendetta like Phil Mickelson and there was other kind of, I would say, greedy intentions. But there wasn't a player apart from maybe Cameron Smith who went. But but John Rahm is that potentially that player who could be the tipping point. And I think that's that's the shame. I hope I've, I hope I've made some sense there with those comments. No, you have. I mean, I've got. I've got a question. I mean, going back to your to your answer, which of the of all the players that have moved to live, which is the one that have surprised you the most? I mean, the move that uh, I think. And, and last week we had um, we had a very interesting guest here, which I would say for me it was the one that that kind of changed the picture when it because as you said, I mean, most of the guys that were moving they were either past their prime or or you could see it coming but we had last week we had Joaco Neiman uh, which is was a, one of the upcoming stars I mean on the PJ tour with a very bright future ahead and and we happened to have him uh, last week here in in the show and for me that was that was that was a huge uh, surprise John for some reason I could I'm not gonna say I could see it coming but I know how friends he is with uh, with with Mickelson and they've got the same the same agent um and and the way he talked about Liv, I, I don't know it didn't surprise me as much but I mean I, it's it's it was hard for me to see somebody as as, as Joaquin Neiman leave 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 for Liv. yeah I think any young player who was on the way up it was a surprising move uh Joaquin being one of them Cameron Smith um Abraham answer you know a few of those guys they were on the way up and, and this has always been the thing that I, I mean, they've always been the biggest surprises to me you know I think the, and I and I still want to believe anyway in my in my heart of hearts that in their heart of hearts so I still want to believe that in their heart of hearts they they deep down know that the best competition truly the best competition is to be had obviously in the four majors but then at the players championship and the Arnold Palmer and Riviera and you know Wentworth uh, at these big, big tournaments that are played in, in historic venues. I want to believe that. I still kind of do believe that. 
So to me, there is still hope, you know, and, and this is something that I've been trying to think about lately rather than just portray a depressing message. You know, it's it's what's <laughs> what's the opportunity out there for the PGA Tour and the DP World Tour moving forward so that when John's contract is up in three years' time and when these contracts are finished, they have one thing's for sure, they're not going to need the money. So what the <laughs> offer, the, the, the proposition that needs to be there in front of them needs to be attractive. They need to be able to look at their potential schedule. You know, right? That is... That is truly growing the game. I'm going to be playing globally. I'm going to still be playing for a lot of money. I'm going to be playing in competitive environments against the best players in the world, Scotty Scheffler, Roy McIlroy, and Cam Smith in Australia, in Europe, in America, all around the world. This is something that I think now there's never been a more glaring opportunity for, the, in my opinion, anyway, it's smacking the PGA Tour in the face right now to try to, to create something that is outside of the box and it, it, and this is where it's going to be interesting to see and I, and I am doubtful because of the american influence and the kind of you know the exceptionalism that obviously exists within america generally but certainly within the pga tour and, and the american players they're going to have to try and look outside the box if they want to try and get players like john Rahm and cameron smith back on side i think in two and three years time well of, of all the things you've said uh, eddie um i want to go back to the to the um, to the fact that uh, obviously leadership uh, underestimated or underrated or whatever uh, about what the, the the Saudis wanted to 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 do. Um, obviously, uh, Keith not listening but saying no uh, without even thinking uh, about what was going on. And Jay, even they he didn't even. Uh, get together with the Saudis. Um, that was a huge mistake. And you said you, you, you didn't want you, you wouldn't want to be uh, on, on their shoes. Well, I, I'd rather be on their shoes. They always finish second on, on the money list every year, uh, whatever they do, it's okay. Uh, with, with all, they can miss the cut, uh, every tournament and they still finish second on the money list. So, I'll take the, I take their shoes uh, because obviously what they've done is it's quite uh, it's been quite quite um, low profile stuff. So uh, I'm I'm quite disappointed, especially uh, with with Keith Pelly, which is what we are more close to. Um, uh, in 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 my personal case, uh, I, my brother got uh, betrayed hard by Keith personally. I think I think these guys, they have too much power and they, they can do or, or undo whatever they want. And, and it's the, the job they've done. It's, it's quite, it's quite low. And, and I just wanted you to know, uh, you, 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 you obviously already know because you are inside and you, you, as you said, um, They've done uh, major mistakes, but uh, the way they handle things. Uh, yeah, if you, if you if you are the, the the most powerful tour on on earth, obviously PGA Tour, you don't you don't need those kind of fights, uh, ban things, and 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 do the destruction other than than, than trying to get away with that. Yeah, no, listen, I. Talking specifically about Keith and and the DP World Tour, I mean, um, one thing I would say is Keith's remit, you know, his key performance indicators, if you like, they they are twofold as far as I understand, and that is playing opportunities for the members and increased prize funds. And actually, if you go back over time, to his credit, he has been able to achieve both of those things through very difficult times and and challenging circumstances. Now, that's not to say that I. I'm in love with every decision that's been made. For example, take the the selling of the naming rights of the European Tour to DP World to DP World. Now that brought in a lot of money, so that you know that that ticks one of the boxes. It t ticks one of the criteria, and I as a player benefit. We as players benefit. Keith benefits too. But ultimately, he was set those parameters by the board. He he hasn't just made those up. That was the board that gave him those key performance indicators to work towards, and he has achieved them. So I think if there is if there is any it's easy to say criticism because no one could have foreseen everything that would have happened by the time Keith came in to say now with it be the pandemic and also then live stuff. But, you know, I think if something could have changed or been more, if we could have been more agile as a, as an organization, it would have been at various times to change maybe the key performance indicators. But 
you know, that's an easy thing to say. It's very challenging to do at the time. And, um, you know, it, there's so much randomness and unpredictability with all of this. And, and as far as I'm aware, and the people that I've spoken to who are high up at the tour and who were privy to, a, well, frankly, all of the information and the offers that were on the table, and I trust them when they tell me, whether it was the past chairman of the tour or whoever it might be, you know, that the, the, the PGA Tour deal was the best deal on the table. You know, I trust them. And, and I think if I was in Keith's shoes, I probably would have made the same decision. And I think a lot of people would. I think it was a it was not just a safe decision. It was, it did offer a lot of security for its members moving forward. And, um, listen, there are of course drawbacks, you know, and I've been, you know, I've been critical lately of the 10 cards and that landed me with a lot of hot in a lot of hot water with Keith. And uh, he didn't like what I had to say at all about it. Um, uh, but listen, right. I, it's not that everything's great and rosy, but that's a traditional kind of transaction, transactional relationship, right? Unfortunately, it's again, it's live and their influence that kind of distort, what's achievable and sustainable in the long term. And I think that that's, and also I've never really heard a cogent argument as to the counter, you know, what could have happened with live and, and what it would have looked like. And, and, th and there are so many risks that were attached with that, that I, I can to stand up for Keith for, for one moment. I can, I can understand the decision he made. But uh, as, uh, as, sorry, Gonzalo, as, as you said, uh, Keith has done good things, uh, which are bringing mo more money and playing opportunities. That's fine. But uh, if you do so uh, by selling assets uh, and not and not uh, taking care of your product and, and and building about your product, that's that's not that's not a great decision because you have more money now. But you are you already sold your assets, the naming, uh, you're giving away your best players every year. <clears throat> that's selling assets. Uh, your 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 you, uh, he sold uh, or or the DP World Tour sold fifty percent of the TV rights uh, of the of the tour. You have more money because you've sold assets, but those assets are already gone. So uh, you, it's it's fake money for me. Uh, which, but that's that's totally another. Uh, I mean, well, we could we could be think, talking I think, about I think, it, Larry. It's it's it's. I think we have to go a little bit back on time. I mean, we think it looks like um, Keith's era started when 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 um, when the PIF uh, approached him. And, and no, I mean, if if some of the paperwork that came out now after the the strategic alliance, or I mean, lately earlier this year. I mean, the PA tool was considering the the DP world a distressed asset. That's 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 the, the actual wording. I mean, and, and my question is, how did we get to that point? Because that I mean, that that was before the strategic alliance. I know we did we did have a lot of struggle with the pandemic, but my question is, I mean, and I've always and I and I and I told this to the to the previous chairman to to David Williams at the time. I said. I mean, my feel was, and, and, and as you know, Eddie, I, I went to, to live in the U.S. and play on the PGA Tour for a while. And then when I came back, my feel was, hey, hey most of the sponsors are gone and we're kind of financing our own tournaments. I mean, we were the ones uh, paying for our own tournaments. And yeah, the tournaments were great. We were having a lot of tournaments and the money was great as well. I mean, at the time it was, I don't know if $2 million or $1 million and a half. I mean, we had plenty of tournaments and the money was okay. But my question to David Williams at the time was, is this sustainable in time? And then, of course, the pandemic came, a strategic alliance, all that, all that. And, and I mean, and now financially, it looks like we are in a, in a good situation if you look at the tournaments and the monies. But as, as Alex said, I mean, it's at what cost? At what cost? Not only selling our TV rights, 40% uh, of that, um, which is kind of selling... Um, um, your heart, yeah, and 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 more importantly, and 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 Eddie has been critical of that, and so have I, uh, and 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 well, Keith just has a different point of view, which is giving ten cards away, and 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 Eddie uh, Eddie made a perfect example in Twitter earlier this year, where he said, well, what if you give your ten, your ten best, uh, you've got a, you own a company, and 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 your ten best employees, your the best best guy in finance, best guy in accountancy, best guy in marketing, I mean, boom, they go away to play to the competition, to work for the competition. I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, that's it's it's very hard to find another ten guys every year that are gonna be, they're gonna be playing as well as as the other ten did and selling the TV and doing all that. So it's I don't know. I think we're getting ourselves in a very difficult situation. 
and 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 hopefully we'll see we'll see how it goes i mean i'm i the only thing i just hope to be wrong i've always tell key the same thing i mean it's not if if i'm selfish and i'm just looking at the short term i know that we might be fine for the next three four years and probably that's what i've got left in golf if there's if i've got anything left of golf in me but but i mean i want to i mean i i'm a big strong defender and and of the european tour and i want to see succeed in the long term and and i don't know if in the long term there's going to be such thing as the european tour or dp world tour or whatever you want to call it well yeah i have the same concerns and i, I i'm actually i i think given the decisions that have been made that we're on the tracks the trains kind of there are no brakes left on it now and that there probably isn't going to be mm. in the medium to longer term and we will look uh, it would look almost fully consolidated with the pga tour and look something quite different um but a few things on on keith's tenure i mean i i remember when i when keith first came out shortly after i was on the committee and you know he he took on the pga tour i mean the advent of the rolex series was was to do exactly that you know there was eight of those initially and i remember him saying in committee meetings like i want to give rory I want to give the top players, Justin Rose at the time, you know, an option to come and play more golf in Europe. And shortly thereafter, the PGA Tour just upped all of their prize funds to nine and $10 million. And, and Keith quickly realized that he could not compete financially with the PGA Tour. So, you know, it's not as though Keith has always had this vision that we should be subservient and play second fiddle to America and the PGA Tour because he really hasn't. He has had ambitions for this tour, but I do think he's realized that, and as And there are factors that are far beyond his control, whether it be the ease of travel in the US, the pension, the prize funds, the dollar, the strength of the currency and the impact that's had on prize funds in the last 12, 15 years. All of those things have come together to make Keith's job as the CEO of the European Tour just that little bit harder to compete directly with the PGA Tour. So so I am sympathetic to to Keith and some of the, not to mention the the pandemic to, to some of the issues he's had to overcome. And again, I would just make the point that his remit has the key performance indicators were not set by him. As far as I'm aware, they were set by the board and, you know, there's the board that effectively chose to employ him via us. So, you know, I, I, um, but again, that's not to, I'm, I, I'm just offering the other side for Keith and, mm. and I, and I do agree with you both on the 10 cards. I think that that is a, a real issue and I can see the long-term uh, problems that are going to be faced. Um, but there are also, it should be said, on the distressed asset front, I mean, there are many, many companies, you know, global companies like Uber, for example. I mean, they don't make any money. The European tourism really, as far as I'm aware, never made any money. There would be, you know, it depends how you want to define a distressed asset. It's not to say a distressed asset has no value. The European tour still has a ton of value in many of the tournaments that it has. And it's just important that players, wherever they're playing with that are on live or the PGA Tour, they come and play their home events. That's the number one thing that's got to happen because that continues to add huge value to those domestically. And then the other events like the Wentworths and the Scottish Opens and our big heritage events, you know, that they can they still add a ton of value and I'm sure they will do moving forward. So listen, that, that's kind of how I see and feel it. But But if I had to make a prediction about where things will end up in the medium to longer term, I would be surprised if we were not entirely swallowed up by the PGA Tour and consolidated, and and then there was something that you know some of our best events became part of, you know their their big thing, and then there was maybe a layer below that. Um, now that's not to say that can't be worked out in a way that's still compelling, and you know has many opportunities for players. It just would look quite different, and uh, and it would be it would certainly be sad to the guys like like us. Who, who really value the history of the European tour. Now, that's just a prediction. That's not saying, you know, I, could, I hope I'm wrong to your point there, Gonzalo. <laughs> no, I, I like what you said about playing national opens. And, 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 and I know this year you were you were critical of the English players or the, that didn't come to play the British Masters, which I agree on my times in the committee. I spent eight years of the committee. We, we, we were very strong on that. And actually it was, it was one of the conditions, I, I mean, well, of, 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 of keeping your membership was that you had to play your national open uh, because I think that's crucial and, and, and we are concerned. I mean, I think one of the big uh, losers of, of John moving to moving to live is the Spanish open. Of course, the Valderrama event is going to get only bigger 
now that John is there. But I mean, my big concern is what's going to happen with the Spanish Open if Ram is not there. So I think I think I think it's 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 we have to emphasize a lot of that. How important is that Rory comes to the Irish? How important that I mean, because the likes of Tyrrell Hatton and Justin and all those they come play the British Masters and Wentworth. I mean, that's what the locals want to see. They want to see their their heroes. I mean, their 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 their, their, their national players playing in their Open, and and, and that's. That's absolutely because that's that that's the 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 heart of the European tour is their national opens, the Spanish Open. I mean the the Dutch Open, the well maybe the British Masters is not an English Open anymore, but the Scottish, the Irish. I mean that's that's the the heart and soul of the of the European tour, and we can't let those die like we did, for example, with the Portuguese Open, or or maybe the Italian Open. And what's going to happen with the Italian Open now that the Ryder Cup is over? We know what's going to happen. You know that tournament slowly is going to get smaller and smaller. I mean, it's it's French a shame. Open or French Open. I mean, French Open is probably the perfect example. Yeah, it is. Um... You know, the French Open, I will say, was even when I remember playing in 2017 and 16 in the Rolex series, it, it was never that well supported. I've always found that slightly odd with, with France. But, you know, obviously Italy, when Francesco has played in the past, particularly thinking of times in Monza, it's been fantastic. Francesco didn't play this year in, in Rome and, and there wasn't much of an atmosphere. So I, I completely agree. And I know Keith completely agrees as well, the importance of getting the home players to play the home tournaments. That is he is fully on board with that and he's working hard. And I would I would suspect actually that one of the things that will happen post John going to live is there will be some sort of arrangement where the live players can play the DP World Tour event, but <clears throat> they have to play their home. Maybe they can only play their home event if it doesn't clash. For instance, I know Thomas Peters has just been announced to play Belgium next year, I which that, yeah. I thought was interesting and maybe suggested to me something had been said behind the scenes and now i know belgium this year clashed with the live event obviously it doesn't next year and maybe there's nothing john can do about that um it may have been a condition with john signing though i mean we know how much he loves playing in madrid at the spanish open i would have thought that maybe there would be something in that live contract condition that says no i want to be able to play in my spanish open and uh, and i think that keith will bend over backwards to allow that to happen because we've all seen that event the last few years because of john has just been magnificent i love going to madrid in that tournament and and i hope john's there next year uh fully hope he's there next year and you actually and you played well there this year and you save you kind of save your car i mean i know it's you've been a bit of a struggle this year for you but that was a that was a that was a good week for you even though i mean we still they still show in that 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 pool on 17 which yeah. ended up being i thought you were gonna toilets. say you, you saved par from the toilets that's why i smiled yeah <laughs> Well, that was that was a, a a hell of a week for you. I know. I mean, you had you didn't have the best of the Sundays, but overall a good week that that kind of uh, helped you save your card. I mean, um, because hey, let's talk let's talk about a bit about, about your golf. I mean, you you I think if I don't remember badly, you got on tour. Is it 2014? Uh, 2014 was kind of your full year on tour. 13, 2013. 13, 13, 13, that's, yeah, that's it, that's it, that's, that's, um, and that's what the, the time when, when I moved to the, to Miami, so we didn't get to play that much together, and, and, and it took you a while to win, but then you, it, then it came 2018, you won Qatar, you won the British Master, which at the time, well, it is, still is, but I mean, it was a big, it was the time that when Justin Rose was, was hosting, at, at Walton Heath, one of my favorite courses in England. Um, and then what, what's happened since, uh, Eddie? I mean, uh, I don't know. There's been injuries. Of course, we had the pandemic. It's uh, how, How's your game going and, and how are you feeling uh, going forward to, to getting into 2024? Yeah, well, I had a I had a back injury at the end of 2018 and that, that set me back a bit. I mean, I had some good results at the start of 2019, but it was really... That was entirely off of confidence you know i <clears throat> i think you you know i wonder what you think about this as a fellow golfer but i i've always thought that what tends to lead good performance is 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 your skill set and then you you perform well and your confidence comes at the end and then you have this period where you you have this goldilocks moment where everything's great but then actually when the form dips the confidence and the expectations stay high and I think some of my good results in 2019 was simply just because my expectations of myself and my confidence was so high, but my skill set wasn't nearly the same as it was at late 2017 and 2018. And then the pandemic came and, uh, you know, I didn't pick a club up for two months and that was the worst thing that I've ever done because when I next picked a club up and all I did was train physically and when I next picked a club up, my backswing was, you know, it was the 20 degrees shorter and then 
as a consequence of that, I just started building in these terrible downswing kind of habits, you know, pulling really aggressively with the club and losing body shape. And frankly, it's just taken me a hellishly long time to kind of overcome what's been built in from that period onwards. Now, I will say, I think that I'm slowly getting there. And, um, you know, I, we moved house a year ago. We put a simulator in maybe nine months ago in my house. So I'm doing, I'm, I'm working more than I've ever worked on my swing. And I'm actually really enjoying that. I'm not, I'm not seeing a coach at the moment. Haven't been since last July, since July, so six months or so. But I, I'm, uh, I'm kind of enjoying that process. You know, I'm looking at my swing and it could go one of two ways. And if, if it goes badly, <laughs> then I'll have to maybe ask Alex for some advice because I know how good a job to do with Pablo. Uh, I think you work with Pablo. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, it's at the moment I feel, I, I still feel like next year I'm going to put the driver back in. So that's the other feature of my game that's been a I was going to say, I was going to say yeah. you're playing the mini driver. As, as, as yeah. Last time I saw you were using that tailor made mini driver. Is still, yeah, still using that one? Well, no, I'm not. I, I put a driver in in Qatar. And so there's there's one thing that I found, which I think is the, it's the first thing I've ever found in my career that I can really rely on to give me a feeling that I can trust with a driver, and that's the Pro Sender. Uh, and I don't hit balls with it, but I just set it in my right arm, and I just stand there, and I, I kind of in transition just try and get my right wrist to really lay down into the cup of the Pro Sender so that, as you could imagine, you're sort of shallowing it with your wrists and you're keeping the mass of the club just way back, way behind you. And that's the only thing I've found in my whole career up to this point that I, so I'm quite excited about that because I think that that's a, that's a very playable feel for me and it's going to be able to get me in play, you know, 10, 15 yards further up the fairway. And then if I'm swinging well from there, uh, my iron play is what kind of, you know, is what is my strength. So um, I, I'm still confident that 24 could be uh, a very good year for me and, and I need it. To, well, I kind of need it to be because gets me away from thinking negatively about the game and and just kind of I, I really am at a place now probably a bit like Rory although n nearly as good where I just want to focus on my golf and and um play good golf because we all know that's what makes us happy isn't it hey Eddie we're not we're I mean I know you were playing in Australia last um uh, last few weeks you you went there we're not we're here I, I've never been a big fan of having simultaneous tournaments on tour I mean the same week um, but I know you've played in South Africa, you've played in Australia. Larry and I were having this discussion a few weeks back. I mean, what's what is better? What would we do if we had the chance of playing both? How was how how was your experience in us? And I mean, because I ha we have the feel from the outside, the courses seem to be better in Australia. The crowd seemed to be a little better. I don't know about the competition. Um, I think there were a few more international players there. I don't know, um, but I wanna, I wanna, I wanna hear your thoughts on that because I mean, uh, we are big fans of of, of playing in us. Nothing yeah, against my... South Africa, by the way. Nothing against South Africa. It's just the altitude and the Kikuyu grass and the South Africa <laughs> in there. I mean, it's nothing against South African golf. It's just I like Australian golf a little bit. Yeah, I, it was my first time to Australia, so that was kind of why I wanted to go. I had never been there before, so to go to Brisbane was great, but to go to Sydney was just incredible. I could not believe what a city uh, Sydney is. It's it's quickly become my favourite place, and I can't wait to go back there, really. And actually, missing the cut was kind of a godsend because me and Jen just got to spend the weekend sightseeing, and then we, we stayed on for four days in Bondi Beach the week after. So we had such a good time. And... Um, I would definitely go back in the future, hopefully. I, I think next year that event might be in Melbourne, actually. So it might go Brisbane, Melbourne. So I'll definitely try and go back if I can for, for that. Uh, but no, I, I on balance, I would say that Australia it would be somewhere I would rather play than South Africa. I mean, I've, I've never played well down in Africa generally. And I think for me, um, being, you know, I remember playing in a WGC in Mexico of all places on the final day with Bryson DeChambeau and Alex Noren. And we were all, and this was at the time when we were all playing quite well, and especially Bryson and Alex, they were tremendous players, but we were all playing shit. Sorry if I can't swear on this podcast, but no, no, that's we were really proper, struggling. Proper language on this program. Right, okay. And, and I was watching us all, and we were all quite steep into the ball, and we were hitting our irons all over the place, and they had Kikuyu grass in Mexico, Chapultepec, I think it was called. And I just said to them, I said, guys, do you struggle on this type of grass historically and Noren Alex said well other than his win at the Ned Bank he's never played well in Africa and Bryson just couldn't deal with it and so I think for me being quite steep into the ball cuckoo grass is a disaster because I end up hitting a groove high so then I lose my distance and then I respond to that and lose my body shape and then start hitting pulls and all sorts I just respond to the ground conditions in such a bad way whereas at least in Australia with the tighter turf it kind of matches and mirrors a better general pattern of movement for me so um 
yeah, that's a very specific example as to why Australia might be better for me. But I, uh, I, I loved Australia. I can't wait to go back. I've, I've never played golf in Australia. Um, I've been to Sydney. It's an amazing city. I can agree more. The best burger I've ever had, Bondi Beach. Don't ask me why. I mean, <laughs> you would think the best uh, hamburger you will have it in, in the U.S. No, no. Bondi Beach, best burger I've ever had. Um, only bad thing is the taxes. I mean, every, when you play there, they, I mean, they take away 50%. But, hey, we don't play for money, do we, Eddie? We I, get the impression, the I get the impression you don't like tax, Gonzalo. <laughs> no, I don't like I don't, I don't tax. Full stop. Yeah. <laughs> Period. <laughs> like, I don't like, no, I like reasonable tax. I mean, I'll be willing to pay 20%. I'll be willing. That's probably one of the things that Trump did the best when, when, when he, when he got into office, I mean, 20% tax. Um, that's what we paid when I was in the U S I thought that I would be more than happy to pay 20. I mean, no, over that, I think it's, it's kind of a stealing, but, mm-hmm. um, but yeah, I'm not fan on taxes. I have to admit that. <laughs> Yeah. Hey, Eddie, um, other thing, let's change subjects. I mean, we don't want to keep you much longer. Um, but um, I mean, of course, I know you, you, you are not, you don't watch um, Leaf Golf, but I mean, I, I know there's probably, if there's one tournament you're not going to miss, and it's Ryder Cup. Uh, we had an amazing Ryder Cup in Rome. Uh, we all, I mean, we, we, we can disagree that, uh, we, I mean, we can agree that, that, that Luke make an exceptional job. But to be honest, I'm quite surprised that he took uh, he took the captaincy uh, for Beth Page. I think um, I don't know. I think I think the 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 rotation in captains have worked nicely for Euro, and and also thinking I think he has probably more to lose than to win. Eh? What, what's what's your take on that? Yeah, he probably well, you would imagine. Well, no, he could. He does have stuff to gain because if if they go out there and win, and and it's deemed that his captaincy was a defining factor, then you know he's going to be selling books and and speeches for years to come, <laughs> more than Paul McGinley is. So, uh, you know, it can it can really work he'll, for him. He'll but, get hair as well, so, yeah. so same as Paul. He'll, he'll yeah. get a new, <laughs> yeah. some more hair. <laughs> but uh, I suspect, I suspect. Um, Maybe there's a degree of politics involved from the tour to try and keep Luke on, given the players that are on live. And, um, you know, I hope it's not too oh. crude a thing to say, but just to keep uh, guys like Lee Westwood and Poulter and Sergio away from the captaincy, who I think we would all agree deserve it on merits. But obviously, with everything that's happened, it's unlikely at this point. So I think um, I don't think it's a bad thing necessarily that a, that a player, if they sign up in future for the Ryder Cup captaincy, that they may be expected to do a home and away. I think that's actually quite a good. Uh, it's a, obviously a huge commitment, and Luke put a lot into it, as we know. And and this and and I'm sure there's a well, I know there's a significant monetary incentive to do it as well. So, um, which probably has gone up uh, this time around for Luke. So I'm sure it's worth his while financially as well. Um, no, for for sure, for sure. I just I just think that I always I'm a, I'm a strong believer if 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 ain't, if ain't broken. Don't fix it. I mean, I think the rotation, I mean, uh, changing captains every two years, it seemed to be working for Europe. I know we've, we've struggled the last couple of away matches. Um, and, and don't get me wrong. I mean, I think he did a phenomenal job. And I'm sure he's going to do the same at Beth Page, even though it's it's a kind of hostile um, play, yeah. place to, to, to go. But, uh, yeah, in a way, he doesn't have anything to lose because he's going to be difficult to 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 retain the trophy but in the other hand i was thinking i don't know i mean when you've done so well it's it's going to be complicated to 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 match uh, what he's achieved in rome which has been yeah you know. well i think i think beth page is going to be an interesting venue uh, i know in the past the americans have set up their courses to suit them and we've you know kind of done the same but i mean i only paid played beth page in the 2019 pga and i didn't make a birdie for two days now there, there could have been no rough on that course and i don't think i would have made many birdies i mean it is such a demanding golf course and i don't think there's a way you can set that course up that makes it particularly favorable to the american golfers i think that the, whichever way you set that up it's going to favor great ball striking is what i'm trying to say and, and I, I think we would all agree that you know the top echelons of the upper echelons of the european players seem to have that edge so um, with Ludwig, you know, obviously still going to be there in the next couple of years' time. Victor, Tommy, Rory, it's, uh, John, obviously, you know, super strong team, Tita Green. So I, I do think we've got a very good chance, apart from the fact that the crowd is obviously going to be uh, brutal. 
It is indeed. It is indeed. Hey, Eddie, and last but not least, um, what's your take on the um, on the rollback? Are you are you for it? Are you against it? I mean, here we've got mixed feelings. I'm all for the rollback. Larry is Larry, not so much. But uh, I mean, I'm uh, we're we're asking every every guest we've got here in the show. We want to ask them. Just I I think honestly, I mean, in my opinion, I think it's it's a step on the right direction, but it's it's not enough. I think it has to do with uh, with with changing the the size of the drivers and the, and the, probably the um, the sweet spot of the drivers being too big and too and too permissive. But um, what do you think about it? Yeah. So last year when when I was on the committee, we had a presentation to us from the RNA and from Titleist. And during the RNA presentation, they told us something quite interesting, which I didn't know. That two years ago at the Alfred Dunhill Links, they tested um with a, a driver that had a massively reduced or a much reduced moi and so a smaller sweet spot and this is with a standard ball and and what they found is when players missed the middle that it went 30 yards less far and so you know when i discovered that i thought that in my opinion forget the kind of for a moment park the you know how how easy is it to do forget the kind of practicalities of it for a moment from a from a from the standpoint of if I'm a viewer, um, if I'm watching a player under pressure and they start to miss the center of the club face, which we kind of know invariably happens, and they start to have 20 yards, 30 yards less, you know, far off, less far off the tee, that is quite compelling TV. Um, and you're really starting to see the effects of not hitting the middle of the club face. And so I agree entirely with you that I think something should be done with the clubs as well as the ball. And, and I do think that they are looking into the clubs as well. Uh, and and I, you know, I, I agree that I don't think it was enough. You know, I was pretty a bit extreme maybe with it when I spoke to Steve Otto from the RNA and I said, if I were you, I would I would roll it all back and I would uh, I would take 10 percent, close to 10 percent off the ball, because by the time 2028 comes around, every kid's going to be swinging it at 120. And that that seven yards, that eight yards or 15 yards is going to become five or six yards. And that's nothing, quite frankly. Um, so, you know. You might as well roll it more back now. That was my feedback on it. And obviously, you know, understandably, maybe they've not listened to that. But uh, I, I'm with you. I, I do think there needs to be a rollback. And pr for the sim simple and principal reason for me is that I just want to see more guys hit 14 clubs more regularly in golf rounds. Uh, I think that the, the skill from hitting a driver to a six iron to a pitching wedge, they're all three different skills. And the best golfers through time have been, generally speaking, the guys who have been able to do all of those three things in equal measure um and they've been dominant and, and we shouldn't be trying to have a game where you can dominate by just hitting the driver and the short irons and never have to hit mid and long irons so you know we do need to make sure without courses going to eight thousand yards long that we can that we can do that uh, and so I, i'm for the rollback generally team team gone larry no, uh, uh, gonzalo uh, don't be stupid <laughs> uh, eddie is saying exactly what, what i said i mean the the, the proposal or the, the rollback they are proposing now is totally useless. In 2028, it will it will make no difference. So uh, making all this move for for nothing on the because you are trying to assess something that is 0.5 percent of the of the people that plays golf. And if you try to address those those that amount of players, and it will be useless. Uh, it's not a good idea. The, if you don't change drivers or you or you don't change the the spin on the ball, you you it's the the, the rollback is totally useless. Um, it it won't hurt it, it won't hurt as as they de, as they say uh, to the amateur players because I'm an amateur player and for me the ball flying five yards less or six yards less is is nothing because if if I hit it a little bit. If I hit a miss hit uh, just a fraction, uh, I lose all those uh, all those meters. And if the ball goes less far, I won't uh, I won't um, how do you say it, Gonzalo lose uh, so many balls. So that's it, it's a good 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 move for me. A win win. But, a win win. <laughs> win win situation. But the rollback that they are proposing is totally useless. If don't if they don't change the woods and the spin on the ball. Nothing. So, For me, as an and as uh, as an spectator, I I would like to see the ball spinning more. If the ball spins more, the the miss hits go right and left, and that's that's what makes the golf more interesting. Other than hitting the all all the clubs on on your back, as you said, Eddie, uh, 
uh, watching the people um, struggling a bit uh, sideways it's it's very important for for yeah. the enjoyment so, of the of the game and so when when tightless presented again that was one of the things they said they said that if, if the ball changes we will be changing all of our clubs to accommodate this new ball and we will be working towards lower spin options to suit you guys as professionals and so again given that they were going to change the clubs anyway just by changing the ball why not change the clubs you know why not add that add in and the, the thing i would say and this is goes, goes back to the kind of unintended consequences and things you can't foresee we 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 had to give our feedback to the RNA about the bifurcation, the model local rule, and and we agreed with the PGA Tour that it wasn't right. Now, in turn, what comes back is a rollback for everybody. Now, I don't actually think on balance that that's better than the bifurcation, the option to bifurcate and the model local rule. And so, you know, the pressure that was applied, I think, by frankly, um, the the manufacturers on those players, uh, all of the players, and I think the tours was, was significant during that period, and and that would have had a huge impact on the, the decision making as well so um yeah i just wanted to add that in yeah no no i, I mean i agree it's uh, drivers i mean the driver size must be changed and especially the the um, the sweet spot I, I i keep telling the same as before going back to the spanish open at club de campo on 15 i hit my driver and i hit it so far on the toe i think i've, I've never i've never missed hit a ball so badly on the toe I kid you not, if I had a persimmon driver, I probably would have missed the ball and definitely hit somebody in the crowds like 20 yards away. This thing went to the middle of the fairway, literally middle of the fairway, as if nothing happened. If I hadn't told nobody or there wasn't even that T mark on the on the club face, nobody would have known. I mean, I think I've almost missed the ball. That's how bad it was. Well, it was right in the middle of, of the fairway. See, I, I, I hit it on the motorway there. It shows how bad I am. <laughs> well you're not the first you're not the first to hit that more away so so ready hey listen i i thought i thought this i mean i promise you it was going to be the last one but i forgot we haven't talked about wall ranking points i mean and that that, that subject uh, it's 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 the one that matters especially to the european two players i mean actually i had an exchange with uh with uh with your brother pablo and and, and bob mcintyre who were both uh complaining about the wall ranking points and uh, that's been uh, especially the ones that been that, have, that are given to the European Tour events now that since they change the the way they are distributed, um, and it's I mean it's it's hard to believe I mean Louis Tuesen who's won uh, two weeks ago back to back weeks he just made twenty five I think he made like twenty five or twenty six points winning two back to back tournaments while uh, Scottish Scheffler winning the the hero made 30 I mean in a 30 man event with no cut I mean what are we doing wrong Eddie with uh, when it comes to world ranking I think that's something that it's really setting us a little bit behind the PGA Tour I mean it's very difficult to people like uh, let's say your brother for example who's won who won twice this year and and is not even close to getting to the top 50 in the world or Campillo, I mean, guys have actually have played really well on the European Tour, and it's very difficult to crack in the top 50 nowadays with the, with the current system. It, it is, and it's all designed seemingly to get the guys to go play in America on the PGA Tour at the moment. Uh, now, you know, it should be said, however, that decision making, this, the decisions that are made at the World Golf Rankings, you know, they have been, um, Jay Monaghan and as has Keith Pelley, they've often abdicated from making those types of decisions so because of conflicts of interest so you know they are they are working to, i mean if you speak to eduardo molinari who's obviously you know really the, the go-to kind of guy on a lot of this stuff he's assured me that in time they will accurately reflect um the standard of golf that is played on both tours now i, I still have my i still have my concerns about that and i do know that the guys from the DP World Tour have been going back to the World Golf Rankings and, and saying, listen, are we sure this is right? Do we not need to be making any amendments to this because it doesn't seem to quite be right? And and I and I think this is maybe an example of one of those things where sometimes it's best for the overall global game to offer up something that maybe isn't quite fair. Um, if if the if the DP World Tour are set to benefit by the tune of 10 to 20 percent um to keep things kind of more on an even keel or to reflect the global nature of the game then to me that's a, that's a better evil than having what we have right now where we have this massive disequilibrium if you like and unequal outcomes with the world ranking points i don't think it's right i don't i don't i don't really like it um 
and uh, yeah, I hope that something, I hope that something changes, or I hope that Eduardo is correct, and over two <laughs> years and beyond, we get to see, we get to see this thing fully played out. But uh, there are clearly some peculiarities with it that um, don't quite add up. I have to say, uh, Eduardo, Eduardo always tends to be right in the long term. So uh, we'll give, uh, we'll give. I hate, I hate to admit it, but he, he most of the time he's right. Hey, Eddie, I can't thank you enough uh, for being with us, especially in such a such a special program, our first uh, English um, speaking uh, podcast. So uh, thanks for that. I mean, uh, I really appreciate it. I think uh, we are not only a, an amazing player, but. Uh, uh, a guy that it's always fun to talk to. Uh, you are not only intelligent, but uh, but uh, you are articulated and and critical and 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 vocal. I mean, you don't you don't. I I, I like I, I like you because you are never afraid of speaking your mind, and that's something that I really appreciate on on, on people. So um, thanks for. I think uh, I think I speak up. I speak on behalf of of the three of us when I, when I thank you very especially for for tonight and um and we will be following you and we'll wish you the very best for 2024 i'm sure that it's gonna be it's gonna be a great year and uh, and we'll be following your your success not only not only as a player but also as a podcaster and a, and a twitter maniac <laughs> thanks guys no i appreciate the chat and uh, have a good christmas and if i i'll see you both in the new year and alex if i'm struggling with my swing then i'll, I'll try and come maybe tap you on the Don't. shoulder and ask for some advice <laughs> Don't that'll be that, that'll be that'll be an honor, Eddie. An honor coming from you. Uh, wh when when are we going to see Eddie Pepper, the chairman of the of the players' committee? Uh, so I'm afraid yeah, it's less likely than ever. I'm not even on the committee anymore. So uh, that that wow. is a story. That is. A story. We're gonna start. We're gonna start here as supporting uh, supporting uh, Eddie for for chairman of the committee. Uh, yeah, we'll we'll like a page. Yeah. Like a Trump message. <laughs> I'm I'm Eddie Pepper and I support this message. Something like that. <laughs> when, we're, gonna, we're gonna start a campaign, a proper yeah. campaign from Golf City Etiquetas. Yeah. When you say when when you say uh, the things, the truths, and you are a pain in the ass for the people, they they tend to take uh, the the good people out of the committees. It it happened the same uh, for me in, in my in my home club. So I was in the in the in the committee, and they took me out because I was a little bit pain in the ass trying to improving things so uh, maybe maybe that that you you are out of the committee it's it's a good uh, it speaks uh, good things about you well i should say that i was the one that came off it uh, i was not forced out but um you know obviously there is context to that which i'm sure we can talk about in person but uh it's yeah. a weird <laughs> committee. the committee i mean I've, I've been a lot of time there and it's amazing i mean you try to do things for the tour and then i mean most of the time you walk out of the committee thinking was that a waste of time i mean because most of the things you you want to change then you can change or somebody has the last word i mean and then keith or or, or the or the CEO, whoever is at the time, I mean, can change things at their. It's 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 tough. It's it's quite uh, depressing, I have to say. But uh, hey, we need we need strong leadership. It's difficult times, and and somebody like Eddie would definitely make a make a hell of a difference. Anyway, Eddie. Um, as I said, best of luck. I know you're starting the season in Dubai. We'll be we'll be following closely. And and again, thanks uh, thanks on on behalf of Golf Etiquetas for for being here with us. Thanks for having me, guys. See you soon. Look forward to it. Thank you, Eddie. Take Thanks care. Right. Good Christmas. Bueno, Larry, eh, pues aquí está el primer programa de Gol sin etiquetas en inglés. No sé cómo, no sé cómo, cómo yo, yo, yo he visto tu inglés un poquito mejor que tu approach, eh. Y, y eso, y eso, y eso que tu approach, eh, Delita. Um, eh, no sé, Gonzalo, o sea. Eh, no sé cómo explicarlo. O sea, lo que lo has dicho muy bien al principio. Eh, yo es una persona a la que sigo atentamente en Twitter porque es no solo sensato, sino que comunica francamente bien y además eh, tiene muchas similitudes con nosotros. O sea, no hay etiquetas. Eh, es mucho más educado probablemente que yo eh, la mayoría de las veces, pero pero es un tío que habla bien, que habla sin tapujos y, y para mí no había mejor entrevista para empezar el, 
el, eh, el sector inglés. Eh, sí que podría haber sido más mediático, quizá, pero, pero como comunicador y como, y como persona que, que habla claro y que, y que está muy metido en el mundo y que ama el golf como nosotros, eh, para mí era la, la entrevista perfecta. Y creo que ha ido bien, a mí me ha gustado, ha sido fluido, eh, él habla como siempre muy muy bien y tú has estado enorme con tu con tu inglés de, de Oxford impecable no, de Oxford, tú, tú, de Oxford tú, heavy. yo soy de yo soy de aquí de Chambery pero bueno no pero tu, tu inglés es muy es muy british eh, así que fenomenal Gonzalo has estado estelar podíamos haber podía hablar hablar un poco mi amero ese, esa mezcla de español e inglés también lo podía haber sacado ¿eh? que se también lo a mí, también... a mí a mí solo se me ha quedado una pregunta del tintero que, que me apetecía pero como tú siempre cierras los programas sin avisarme pues me quedo sin eh, y era y era preguntarle por su precio todos tenemos un precio <risa> y unos, más pero... baratos, unos más baratos que otros la <risa> sin duda, sí. sin duda. Tú, tú y yo viajamos a la escuela él también tiene un precio me hubiera, era una pregunta que me hacía gracia hacerle pero bueno, tampoco era muy relevante así pues, que, pues, así pues, que pues, para mí Estelar eh, Eddie Pepper él siempre, soy muy fan de su golf es un tío que, que, que siempre me ha gustado ver eh, y obviamente como comunicador me parece que tiene un futuro brillante. Yo creo que cuando el golf le deje de responder, eh, por ahí tiene un filón importante. Sin duda, sin duda. Para la gente que no le, que no le conocía, eh, bueno, Eddie Pepper, por supuesto, dos veces ganador del, del European Tour. Ganó en el, en el 2018 el Qatar Masters y el British Masters. Y, y como bien dice Larry, un tipo inteligente y sobre todo que comunica muy bien. Y le pueden seguir, yo recomiendo un, para seguirlo en Twitter, es, es, es muy divertido. Eh, y luego en, su, en, un, en un podcast que ha empezado hace no mucho, pero con dos, eh, con dos profesionales, con Ian Carter y con Andrew Cotter, que es también un, es muy cachondo, eh, que se llama The Chipping Forecast. Así que nada, Larry. Bueno, este ha sido nuestro pequeño regalo de Navidad. No sé, no sé y a lo mejor hay, hay gente que lo puede considerar un regalo, hay gente que lo puede considerar un castigo, pero bueno, a veces, a veces los reyes eh, te traen regalos, a veces te traen carbón. O sea que, eh, Escucha, y a Eddie, a Eddie para acabar le gustan los perros, que tiene igual que yo dos. Y tiene, eh, un braco alemán, tiene un braco alemán como el mío, tiene un bisla y un braco alemán como, como yo. Le gustan los perros, el, el buen vino y el chocolate, o sea, es que podría ser mi mejor amigo claramente. <risa> en este caso, Gonzalo, no, no, no te supera en valores, pero... Pero en, en afinidades de gustos, desde luego que sí. Porque, porque tener un compañero amigo sí, abstemio, no veo. A mí el chocolate y los perros me gustan. Eh, que no me gusta el vino. Pues, si hace falta, para ser más amigo tuyo, pues me soy Bueno, para, para, para eso está tu mujer ahí siempre apoyándonos en casa. O sea que, bueno, no está mal. Bueno, Larry, esto ha sido un, eh, un programa grabado. Así que, bueno, obviamente a lo mejor han pasado cosas esta última semana que, que, que obviamente pues que no hemos podido meter en contexto y en la entrevista. Esperemos que no. Esta semana previa a Navidad ahora resulta que va, se va a unir el, va a transalir la unión del PIF y del PGA Tour y tal y nos manda todo al carajo. Pero, pero bueno. Hemos hecho Has estado el... estelar también jugando con los tiempos no sé, por nuestro invitado la semana pasada porque, claro, ahora... Sabemos que mañana tenemos a Juan con Iman, pero cuando vea esto la gente no sabe un lío de cojones. ¿no? Yo me podría haber hecho un lío de, de, de pelotas. Fenomenalmente hecho, así que nada. Pero la semana que viene tenemos programa en directo. El 1 de enero vamos a empezar el año con programa en directo y vamos un poco a hacer recapitulación de todo lo ocurrido en este, en este 2023. Y hagamos, ¿por qué no? Juguemos a hacer predicciones también para el 2024. Que ese, ese sea nuestro primer programa del año, otra vez con público en directo, otra vez con vuestras preguntas preguntas y, y bueno, espero que perdonéis esta pequeña esta pequeña vacación que nos hemos tomado hoy día de Navidad, pero entendíamos que logísticamente era más sencillo si hacíamos un programa grabado. Así que nada, Larry, te aprovecho para desearte muy feliz Navidad y, y nada, que nos vemos ya en el 2024. Vale, Gonzalo, feliz Navidad, feliz Navidad a todos, gracias. Gracias por escucharnos y bueno, y este será nuestro último programa de 2023, que espero que les haya gustado y lo hayan pasado tan bien como lo hemos hecho nosotros. Así que Larry, hasta el 2024 si Dios quiere. Hasta luego.